So uh, let me do this. Let's see. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, for part A, I'm supposed to demonstrate to you what this setup does. So yeah, I mean, you've seen this motion detector setup before, right? And I set this all up so that when I start to collect, then it'll yeah, read the position of the mass at zero. I zeroed it so that um, this motion detector thinks this is the zero position. Um, if it goes closer, it'll be negative. If it goes uh, farther away, it'll be positive. Good? Nothing here seems surprising. That's how you would expect it to work. So what I'm asking you to uh, look at and answer in the next couple minutes is, hmm, maybe we should do part A together. Um, so yeah, yeah, let me uh, put this here. OK, um, so let me um, make up some space for this. So it's uh, asking a bunch of questions. Um, when it is in this position at rest, let me call this i. And then later on, it's going to ask when the mass is above the equilibrium position, call this um, 2. And when the mass is below the equilibrium position, call this three. Good. And hopefully, you know, this is reminding you of what we were doing before we went to conservation of energy and momentum. Um, so let me draw a free body diagram. Let's, dr let's draw a free body diagram for each of these three cases as we go through and answer the questions that they are asking. So when the mass is here at the equilibrium position, uh, what is the, mm, what are the forces acting on this mass? Gravity and spring force. So let me just uh, kind of draw a diagram for that. Mg and the spring force, do you remember the formula for spring force? Yeah, so the minus kx or the magnitude is k times x. That's a Hooke's law, right? So let me just write down that k times delta x for now. This is coming from Hooke's law that um, hopefully you remember. OK, um, how do the, uh, what's the net force? Um, so uh, it's two, essentially the same question. How, two, how do these two forces compare? One way of asking it. Or the second way of asking it, what is the direction of net force in this case? Net force is zero. How do you know it's a zero? OK, so let me ask the other version. How do you know that these two forces are equal to each other in magnitude? You cannot say because net force is zero. Because <laughs> that makes it circular. Maggie, you said the acceleration is equal to zero? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Stephen, is that what you're going to say? Yeah. So, because you know, you know Newton's second law, net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So, I mean, you can, here, you can see that acceleration is zero. It's uh, at rest, it's remaining at rest. So, uh, acceleration is zero, so the net force is zero. That's, uh, I mean, you know, most of you already have that intuitive feel that here, the, these two forces are equal. And the reason it's equal is because net force is equal to zero. All right, let's go through two and three, which is less trivial. So two says, if the mass is above this equilibrium position, is there still gravitational and spring force on this mass? All right, yeah. And when I let go of my hand, both hands, <laughs> um, what is the direction of net force? Downward, and you know that because it accelerates downward. And um, so what does that tell you about the relative uh, magnitudes of the force? Yeah, spring force is smaller. So that, and that's because, as Stephen said, it's because spring force decreased. Gravity is still mg, it didn't change. But if I, uh, if I lift the mass a little bit, then um, this k times delta x, it's smaller because this delta x is smaller, right? So, when you, so you know, here right now I'm trying to do the pure spring force plus gravitational force description. So this is the actual equilibrium length of the spring, 
as you pull on it, there's an increasing amount of force pulling it back up. So, um, so, so equilibrium position is where the spring force and gravitational force balanced. When I push it up, spring force decreases, and the net force points downward. And you see that in the motion. What about when I pull this down? Someone other than Steven, maybe. Ar Arjun? Um, what, um, so once again, two different versions of the same question. Is, um, how does the gravitational force compare to spring force, one version? Or the second version, what is the direction of net force? Yeah, so, so, yeah, if I, so I'm asking about when I remove my hand, so you know it's going to go upward. So what does that tell you about the direction of net force? Upward, upward right? I'm asking always about what happens when I remove my hand not while I'm holding it. Yeah, so there's a net force upward. And how can you explain that in terms of these two forces that we identified? Does gravitational force change? No, that's still mg. So why is the net force upward now? Spring force increased, right? Because I stretched it out more. Yeah, so you feel like we have intuitive feel for this? This is not too complicated? Okay. So the next part is the part where I want you to ask you to spend a little bit of time predicting. So um, I'm going to do what this problem describes. I'm going to lift the hanging mass up, lift it to uh, somewhere, okay, I can't lift it any higher than this, up to about this point. Let me actually uh, mark that height so that I can do it consistently. So I'm going to lift this mess to about this position. All right. And I'm going to let go. And you know, you can actually look at it. Um, so you have seen this many dozens of times. What happens now is not anything surprising. But what I'm asking you to do now is I'm asking you to actually sketch the position. As a, so this is a function of time. But for convenience, the, each different times are described with a qualitative description. There's a, so let me try to, uh, let me number this, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And let me try to just say it out loud as it goes th through those different times. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. <laughs> OK, it's way too fast. <laughs> but you get what I'm trying to say, right? 0, as it goes down, 1, 2, 3, 4. Good. Did I label 4? Yes. So it's, uh, the times are in sequence of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So um, you know you have some sense of intuition about what that should look like. So I want you to take a minute, uh, sketch it, uh, what it should look like. I mean, it's something that oscillates up and down, but there are many different ways something can oscillate up and down. So I just want you to sketch it out of your intuitive feel, and uh, you'll compare it with the actual experimental result when we do the experiment. All right, uh, I think some people have a more reasonable picture than others. I guess it's uh, easier um, to actually do it and see. So let me do the experiment. Uh, because, uh, yeah, yeah, let me uh, wait. Hmm. I did not think this through. Mm. Are these uh, writings annoying, or can you look at the graphs with, through these writings? OK, 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 so let me do it this way. I'm going to lift it, so I'll hit collect. And I'm going to wait like half a second or, or maybe about one second. So there'll be one second of flat line. So uh, hit collect. OK. So, so that's uh, what you see. Wow, it looks way more. Um, I think it might have been my hand. Let me see. Uh, all right, that looks better. So. Uh, let me leave it there. So uh, this is what you are looking at. Um, starting from the release point, right? Uh, stop me when I'm going through the equilibrium position. Uh, so starting from the equilibrium uh, release point, stop me when I'm going through the equilibrium. Yeah, here, right? So this is the equilibrium. And when you go below that, and this is the lowest point. 
and then you are back at equilibrium, and you are now at the highest point again. So let me zoom in. Uh, can I just zoom into this? No, I can't do that. Um, I, I think this is the easiest way to do this. So it goes from 0 0.28 to about 1.32. Okay, 0 0.28 0 to about 1.32. Uh, wrong mouse. 1.3, was it 32? So this is the shape that you should have drawn. And oh, um, if you're in case you're looking at the other graph, let me hide it behind this one. Okay. So, um, how many of you drew something that looks exactly like this? And this is the sense in which I'm in that it starts out with something that's close to zero slope. The slope increases up to a point here, and the slope actually starts to decrease. And then it gradually comes to a flat line here. And then the slope gradually increases again and then decreases. How many of you drew that? OK. Some of you, I saw you drawing something that looks more triangular, which is fine. Um, so that's why we are going through this exercise. It, um, so intuition is kind of a recalling what you have seen before. And if you've never seen this before, then you need to see it at least once. So all right, so that's the shape for a position graph. Um, I thought there was one more question uh, while we are here. Uh, oh, oh, part C. What function might be chosen to describe this position x as a function of time? So if we had to, you know, just to pick a function, any function, well, not any function, a function that fits this. Uh, if, if, if you had to pick a function to describe this um, as a, you know, position as a function of time, what form of function would you pick? Cosine. Cosine. Oh, yeah, this would actually be cosine. So I might say this is equal to cosine of t. And we are going to have to fix this up a little bit. It has a general shape of cosine. Um, could you imagine this position function looking like a sine shape instead of cosine shape? Sort of depends on how I start it. So if, I, if you are looking at it as, um, so what if instead of starting it like this, if I started it by pulling it down, will it still look like cosine of t, or would you need to change it up a little? Yeah, it looks like negative cosine. Yeah, it looks like sine. So it's not sine, but ne negative cosine. Starts from negative position, goes up, and then comes back down. So to make it look like a sign, I have to do something that's more fancy, like this. I have to you know, give it a little initial velocity. So start it by going up. So what I'm trying to uh, say here is that the difference between cosine and sine, it's a difference in the matter of where you start the motion. You could start it like from here. And if I say, OK, at my time equals 0 is when it goes past the equilibrium position, then that will look like a sign, actually. Good? Everyone OK with that? All right, so this is a um, good enough guess for now. Uh, I'm going to want to modify it a little bit later. And in case you are thinking about it, there are two things wrong with this uh, particular form. Two things, and we'll come back to that later. All right. So the second intuition building exercise that I want to do is the uh, next set of questions. So we looked at the position. All right, that seems fine enough. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to do the same exercise, this time for the velocity. So um, you know, position is a little bit easier, because you can kind of look at it, see that it's moving up and down. So uh, velocity, it's a little bit harder. Um, you have to think through it a little more. So you know, take a minute, check your answer with the, your neighbors. And I guess if you want to see the position curve, this was the position curve. And velocity curve will be different. All right, I think most of you have it. Some of you are fixing up what you had before. Uh, let me just show you the graph. I mean, it was already down there. I hid it because I didn't want you looking at it. Um, this is the velocity curve of the same motion that we did. Uh, let me 
So this is the position curve. This is the velocity curve. Is that as you would expect? Yes. So you know, hopefully you remember that velocity is the rate of change of position. So remember in calculus, um, that means comparing these graphs. This should uh, the value of at this point should agree with the slope at that point. So uh, oh, here's a one thing you, we can actually kind of check. Uh, against something that we know already. Uh, what can you say about the velocity at the equilibrium position? So when the mass is at the equilibrium position, what can you say about how much, uh, oh, do you know anything? Um, uh, too open. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, what kind of description could you give to the velocity at this same time as when the position is at equilibrium position? There's one particular thing you can say about velocity based on what we were doing a few weeks ago. Asia? Maximum speed from the consideration of conservation of energy. When you are at equilibrium position, your potential energy is at minimum. So that will make your um, kinetic energy at maximum. Now what we can do is you can, we can actually look at the kinematics. So look at the slope at this point. Um, this is, uh, I guess in calculus you call this what? Uh, there was a name for this. I mean, the line is tangent, but this particular point, it was inflection point. Wait, inflection point, is that right? Yeah, inflection point. That's where your um, concavity is changing, right? This was concave down, and here it becomes concave up. <laughs> anyway, so this is the position where your speed slope is at a maximum. Because before this, it was at a gentler slope. And after this, it's at a gentler slope again. And when you look at the same point down here, well, yes, it is at the maximum absolute value of the speed, uh, velocity. And the same thing happens as it's going through on a, the other, well, the same equilibrium going the other way. When you look at the velocity, or when you look at the speed, it's at a maximum again. That, all of this makes intuitive sense? Yes? OK, uh, let's do one last thing. So it asks about uh, acceleration. Oh, wait. Um, yeah, I don't know why I never really changed this. You know, I'm kind of running out of time, so let me uh, actually skip this part E. You can do it on your own. And let me just uh, uh, show you this graph. So you saw position and velocity. Uh, what do you think it'll look like if uh, I display the acceleration? Like, will acceleration look like a velocity? No, right? You are taking another derivative, so it shouldn't look like the function that you took derivative of. So what would the acceleration, would it look like anything on the board already, or will it look a little bit different from what's already on the board? Isha? OK, different. Um, how would you describe it? Like if you had to compare it to something else on the board? Flipped upside down. Yeah, let's try it. Let me display here velocity and, uh, wait. So velocity and acceleration. Um, they're going to be in the same color. Oops. <laughs> um, here, let me do it this way. I can set the axis to be auto scale. Oh, wait, that doesn't do anything. Um, <sighs> here, um, <laughs> I'm just gonna have to get rid of um, velocity. All right, so that's the acceleration. It, uh, did I auto scale everything? Uh, No, 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 actually, this looks OK. Um, all right, let me leave it here. So this curve is acceleration. So it kind of looks like the position, except flipped around. And you can explain it based on the velocity curve. So this here, the velocity curve slope is downward, right? So your acceleration is negative. There's a point where your velocity is, curve is flat. Rate of your change over velocity is zero. And that point happens to be the equilibrium position. So there the acceleration is zero, as I was claiming earlier. 
and then um, it goes through the cycle again. Good. So all of this motion makes sense. Yes. Yeah. I want to make this uh, um, the motion that you can just observe by moving this up and down. That uh, that makes sense to start out with because um, it's going to get a little bit math heavy. And um, I will tell you a little bit of uh, secret. Uh, let me just do this one more time. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of secret. So the secret to success in physics and really engineering is that um, for anything that you want to calculate, you should know the answer before you actually do the calculation. So if you're doing the calculation to try to find the answer, the thing is you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you're going to waste a lot of time. So, um, so people who are good at physics and engineering, they actually know the answer before they do the calculation. All the calculation does is it simply confirms what you already knew. So, um, so that's why I'm um, spending a fair amount of class time going through this exercise to make sure that you have a good intuitive mental image for um, the motion of this. So when we describe its position as a function of time, then that it looks like a cosine. Like that's something that you know intuitively before you do any calculation. Uh, by the way, before we move on, let's uh, fix this up. I said that there are two things wrong with this um, function. Um, so did anyone figure out what was wrong with it bef um, while you're looking at it, thinking about it? No, not yet. Let me give you a hint. The thing that's wrong with it is a unit. So this is what I mean by unit. Um, so the quantity that's here, it has to have a very particular unit. This is an input to the cosine function. So it has to come in very particular unit. Right now it's coming in the unit of second. And I'm telling you, uh, that's not right. I cannot put in one second into a cosine. Like you're, I don't even know how to do it. Ooh. I think I might be able to do it on Wolfram Alpha. So if I do it on Wolfram Alpha, it'll, um, it'll complain. So let's see. Let me try to calculate cosine, uh, cosine of one second. Oh wait, it might think hmm, one day, sorry. If I say one second, it's probably going to think it's uh, some notation for an angle. So cosine of one day, then it'll probably complain, yeah, see, try different phrasing options because cosine of one day makes no sense. So what unit should this be in? Hmm? Meters? Okay, I can try that. Let's try cosine of one meter. That's still nonsense. I mean, what kind of quantities does cosine take as argument? Pi, what kind of quantities are those? Period. Not period. Radian. radian, some kind of angle, right? Now, what do you remember about radian as a unit? Asia? It's not a real unit. Radian is just a reminder. So actually, cosine takes a unit less quantities. And this is actually true of any special function. Exponential takes a unit less quantity. Logarithm is supposed to take a unit less quantity, although sometimes you can cheat. Um, any kind of special function that you remember learning in your math class, they are supposed to take only unit less numbers. There's, so only polynomials can take a unit. So this is supposed to be unit less. And what you see here is clearly not unit less, right? right? So we are going to have to introduce a coefficient here to fix that. We are going to end up putting up a coefficient here that's going to have correct units to make this unit less. What is the unit of this coefficient? One over, per, one over second, right? All right, so let's say this is, uh, when we figure out the, uh, whatever this is, it's going to have unit of one over second. So that was the first thing that was wrong about this function. Um, what's the second thing that's wrong about it? Second thing that needs to be fixed. Tickle? Any ideas what's wrong with this uh, form here? I, we, said, uh, we said that the position looked like a cosine, which wasn't too far off, because you know that looks like cosine, right? But, so we started a cosine of t, but that doesn't have a correct unit. So we had to fix that. Fix that. I'm still saying this is still wrong. 
it's not exactly correct. It has, this has to have a correct unit. The left hand side has unit of meter. So this also has to have a unit of meter. The result of cosine, does that have any unit? No, it's just ratio, right? So it has no unit, which means you need another coefficient to make sure that you get the correct unit that will agree with the left hand side. And this is going to have unit of meter. So once we have that, we can actually write down the second thing that I kind of didn't want to do before I write this down. So velocity, we described as time derivative position. We can actually do this derivative. Velocity as a function of time is equal to the derivative of this position. So, well, A is constant. What's the derivative of cosine? Negative sign. And I have to use chain rule. I took the derivative of the outside, and then I had to take the derivative of the inside. When I do that, I get b out. So when you do the derivative, you get minus a times b sine of bt. Right? This uh, minus sign that agrees with uh, what many of you are drawing before. So let's just double check the unit of a times b. A times B has unit of meters times one over second or meters per second. Is that what you would expect? Yeah, yeah. Um, unit of velocity. Yeah, and if you do one more derivative for the acceleration, you'll get that. 